father that's a negative connotation to it. A, a lot of times in our culture, we have what we call father wounds, where some of us have had bad experiences with the father, whether it be in the past or currently. And father wounds is actually a real thing in our lives, both Christian and non-Christian. The, the, the void filled by the father. And what happens is when we take the word our father in, he in heaven, we pray this prayer, when we say the word father, we get a negative mindset of what a father is. But know this, that, that our Father in Heaven is perfect. He is the ultimate example of what it means to be a father. Now whether, now whether you have a positive uh, view of your father or a negative view of your father, God the Father is so much more than that. It's that intimacy that you have. So my hope is, right, that whether you have a good relationship or a bad relationship, you understand the concept of, of God as your Father. Now when we treat God as our Father, it opens up doors to how we feel in, in an intimate setting. That if I know, right, that, that he is like a father and that he wants the best for me, right? That as a parent, you want the best for your kid. You want you want the best for them if you love them unconditionally. But that, that, that is God the Father. And it says in heaven. The next words are in heaven. It means that we pray to a father who is also powerful. That the phrase in heaven points us to a king who reigns over the earth. That, that he is sovereign over creation, sovereign over this world, and he is on the throne. Now, now, now when I pray and I say, God, you're in heaven, what I'm saying is, wait, God, I know you're there, I know you're ruling, no matter what happens on, my, on this earth. See, oftentimes, we look at the surroundings, and our personal surroundings, or we look at the world surroundings, and we say, oh, God must be distant, or where is God in my situation? Where is God in my situation with my family? Where is God in my situation at work? Where is God in my situation with my community? And we fail to see the times that God is actually moving around us. But when the phrase, in heaven, utters from our mouth, what we're saying is, God, I trust you. I trust you that you are in heaven, and that you are sovereign over everything in my life, and you have a plan for me. Our Father in heaven. The next phrase, hallowed be your name. In Jesus' name, and in the Bible, a name implied everything about a person's character. And if you look at it through a lot of the Old Testament characters, if you take up the Hebrew meaning of the name, what the main the meaning of the name often applies to their character, both of what they did and what they will do. For praying these words, we acknowledge that God's character is to be honored. And cherished. And we also express our desire that both the we and others both would do so. You know, Pastor Rex talked about uh, a few sermons ago about people taking Jesus' name in vain. You know? And when we say, How do your name? We cherish the name of God. We cherish the name that it holds true to our lives. We cherish these words that we pray because we know that, that we have been praying not only to a God, but our Father who is in heaven. The next phrase. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. When we pray this word, your kingdom come and your will be done, right? we are praying that God will fulfill the areas of our lives and our school and our work relationships with, with His sovereign will. See, when we pray your kingdom come, we're asking Him that God's kingdom in heaven be an example here on earth. But when we're saying your kingdom come, not only do we want God's uh, uh, love to reign and to rule, right? we, we want glimpses of heaven to appear on earth. Jesus, Jesus, when he was here, talked also about the kingdom. He mentioned that the kingdom is here. But he also mentioned that the kingdom is not yet. And that's the true reality. The kingdom of God is both here and not yet. It's here and not yet. Meaning we have glimpses of heaven here, but we also have glimpses of our earth, sort of, fault of earth as well. For example, right? We have glimpses of heaven where we can see, and pray for people, we can see people be healed. Right? We can pray for people, and we can see either physical, emotional, spiritual healing in their lives. 
But then we can also pray for people and nothing happens. Because the kingdom of God is here, but it's also not yet. We can pray that God, we want your kingdom, we want your will to be done on earth. That we have the ability to operate as individuals and Christians as God's kingdom here. Right? I can see the Holy Spirit speak to me. I, I can give a prophetic encouraging word to somebody. Right? And that's all part of God's kingdom being on earth. But right, there's also sin. And people make choices. And we have free will. That's not that we make free will. We don't make all those good choices. And sometimes in this world, there are things in this world that are not of God. There are things like war and racism and destruction and and things that, that are happening in our world because the kingdom's not here yet. We get to enjoy some of the blessings. God, I can see God move. I can hear his voice. I can see miracles happen. I, I, I can be empowered by the Holy Spirit. All these things are amazing. Things, but I, I pray for God. May your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as in heaven. So we're asking God, what, I want to see on earth, what happens in heaven, right? Heaven, where there's no more sickness, no more pain, no more sorrow. There's full of worship and celebration. There is harmony. There's unity. We see that here. We see that. We see that. We, we see that here. You know, we also see the other side. And the reality is, until Jesus comes back, until Christ returns, the kingdom of God is not going to be fully realized. Or until we get to heaven, the kingdom of God is not going to be fully realized. So we say, God, we want your kingdom here. The next part. Give us today our daily bread. This is our prayer for basic needs. Food, clothing, work, shelter, met. Okay? Give us today our daily bread. You know, before, I uh, used to go to... You know, the market and then get you know your groceries per day every day right you get bread and necessities but now we have things like bj the jam so you stock up for a whole month you know and, and you stock up and you have a lot of this but we have you know our western culture especially we have pantries of this food like we have closets of food and sometimes we, we see this as a western mindset and say give us in our daily bread right we don't know what that means but think about you know that before people used to Every day, go for it and ask for bread. And sometimes we're so blessed that we don't come to God as people who need the daily bread. And, and, and because I have so much in my life, I don't come to God daily with what I need. Whether that's financial blessings or food, or whether there's any spiritual blessings. And, and when, when, when Jesus prays his prayer, he's saying, every day, no, no matter whether you have a great day or a bad day, I'm going to come to God with my daily bread. That one of the gateways to see and hear God is you come before Him, understand that you need God. That, that understand that you need God to survive. That God, if you don't come through for me, I'm not going to get through. Because the moment, the moments are alive where we feel we don't need God. We fail to see him, and we fail to hear him. When you don't, when you have, when you come to your point in your life, when you don't go every day with needing God to get through that day, then you're not going to see him move, and you're not going to hear his voice. But even look at, this, look, look at this passage. Give us today our daily bread. See, it's, it's, it's a unified language. See, it's, 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 it's a God. Not only do I pray for me. Are. I'm going to pray for my community, my church, my small group, my family. Right? No, no, not only give me what I need for the day, but give, 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 give the people in my inner circle, my, my relations, my surroundings. Give me, give us what we need. And forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. This could be a huge stumbling block for a lot of people. Having, receiving forgiveness, being forgiven, is a necessary help of our souls. It's 
It's like food is this, it's just like food is important for your body, like food and water is important for your body. Forgiveness is the key to your soul. That your soul cannot be nurtured unless you are receiving forgiveness and unless you are forgiving others. That if you're not receiving the forgiveness from Jesus Christ, and you're not accepting the work He did on the cross for you, what you're doing is you're putting a barrier between you and God. And because when you put a barrier between your God, you cannot see God or hear His voice. And, and for some of us, what happens is, you know, we don't want to accept the forgiveness, so we feel ashamed of what we do. And, and then the devil tells us lies. The devil, the devil tells us, you know, uh, insecurities about us and, and, not, and non truth about us. Saying that, you know, what you did is not necessarily going to be. But the truth of the matter is that, you know, your sin does not define you. Your mistakes do not define you. Your past does not define you. What defines you is Jesus Christ and you on the cross and you died for your sins. That defines you. So you need to receive forgiveness. Receive forgiveness not only a one-time thing, but a daily thing. That I got to come before God and, and, and present to Him everything that's on my heart, everything that's on my mind, everything that I've done, and give it to Him so I can receive forgiveness, and that breaks the barrier. What's also a barrier, but also a barrier is when we don't think about it. When we don't think about it. Bitterness will kill your soul. Bitterness will kill your soul. It will crumble you, it will ruin you, it will destroy you from the inside and for some of us, we can take the idea of forgiving others and, and not want to do it. But when I look at Jesus and I look at his life, he was the ultimate example of what it means to forgive others no matter how much they wronged you. Somebody in your family, somebody in your job, your neighbor in the street. And, and it, it, we have we all people in this world. We just gotta forgive. And, and I know it sounds easier said than done. But, but if you have a problem with this step, ask God to give you the power and the strength to overcome and, and, and to forgive the people in your life who need forgiveness. And finally, he says, the lead is not temptation, but to deliver us from the evil ones. So we pray for our sins to be forgiven. We pray for uh, the ones who sin against us. But we also pray that, that we don't return to our sins. That we're not tempted by our sins. That, that, that the devil doesn't take a stronghold over us. Right? We, we, we were asking God, help me not be vulnerable in my sins. Help me not be in situations where I can sin. Right? For, for some of us, it's not the sin part, it's just being in the wrong situations. And for some of us, it's not committed to it. It's just being in the wrong situations where we know we will sin. Right? Right? Like, right? If, 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 if there's a talk radio station that makes you angry and mad, stop listening to it. Right? Or if there's, if there's a news channel that, 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 that makes you just furious, don't watch it. Right? Like, but sometimes, we, you know, we gravitate to things that we want to enrage us for some whatever reason. Right? If... if, if if there are situations in your life that, that you need to step away from, or you need accountability from, do that, right? If, 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 there, if there are restrictions you need to put on your, on your computer, or your devices, or your phone, or your life, do that. So when Jesus says, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one, he's asking God, don't lead me into a situation where we're tempted, but not only that, right? Protect me from the hands of the enemy, Satan. Because whether you realize it or not, at work in this world, right, is a battle basically of good and evil. Right? Satan already knows that he lost. Right? He, he already knows Jesus wins in the end. Right? That, 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 that is, you know, unkept secret. Jesus wins in the end. We all know the Bible says that. It's clear, right? But that doesn't mean that Satan's not going to try to do as much as he can on this earth before Jesus ultimately wins. So when we pray this prayer, we're asking Jesus and God to, hey, help me be delivered from the evil one. 
love this passage in 1 John. Chapter 5, verse 14 to 15. This is what it says. This is the confidence we have in approaching God. That if we ask anything according to His will, He <coughs> hears us. And if we know that He hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we ask of Him. Uh, let, me, let me just read that again. This is the confidence, right? This is the confidence that you and me, we need to have. That when, we are, when we're approaching God, that if we ask any according to His will, He will hear us. God, our God, our Father, our Father in Heaven, our Father. God is your Father, your loving Heavenly Father, and He wants to, you to speak to Him. He wants you to communicate to Him. And what? It says that He hears us. Right? It doesn't say sometimes. It doesn't say uh, on a certain condition. It says that He hears us in verse 15. And if we know that He hears us. So first of all, you have that confidence in, in coming to God. But if you know that He hears you, whatever we ask, we know that we have the ask of Him. What a good picture of what it means that the relationship with God is next to God. My prayer is um, that, uh, and I, I, I know some of you talk, but my, my, my prayer is that uh, you got you pulled something away from tonight's class, but also from the past week. My, my prayer is that something uh, grab for you, maybe uh, one or two things will really grab for you, and you can take it and apply it to your life. And, uh, I hope that you've been changed and transformed and moved by this. And I want to close this uh, with prayer. But after, after I pray, don't go yet. I have one more announcement to make uh, after prayer. Let's go before the Father and pray. Father, uh, God, we want to thank you so much for being our Father in our town. Thank you for your love. So right now, Lord, I just want to thank you for some of the love that, that, that you're pouring down. I just, I just feel that this tremendous amount of love that you're pouring down to us tonight. Father and Mother, you're giving us tonight. But I just want to, uh, I want us to embrace uh, your work, embrace your uh, love for us. God, we want to um, pray that you really help us follow our rule of life. Uh, help us to, uh, you know, become closer to you. That's the whole goal of the friendly rule of life. My prayer is that we develop, continue to develop a hunger and thirst for you. May that hunger and may that thirst never go away. May we always know that you are right there with us, you are right there with us. Here we are. We want to speak to us in a new and far life. So I pray that after tonight, after this class, that we have a